May it please the Court, Your Honor. All right. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Motive, means, opportunity, <coughs> guilty acts. That's the basic way to determine identity. So let's talk a little bit now about means, the tools to commit the crime. Family weapons were used to commit this crime. And this is forensic evidence that was presented to you. First of all, we'll talk about the blackout. And you've heard testimony that there were two blackouts purchased in December of 16. And that one went missing around Halloween of 17 years prior to these murders, and that a replacement without a thermal scope was bought in April of 2018. Three blackouts that the defendant purchased can only account for one of them. And it's this third blackout which is the one that's at issue. You heard from Paul's friend, Will Loving. And first of all, let me say this. You heard the defendant in his various statements, and he's very concerned about saying that there's no, they didn't have a blackout. There was no blackout along with them, even though he slipped up once and said, yeah, we were out looking for hogs. And you heard from his law partners that do the same thing, saying, yeah, you can look for hogs in the daytime. Very, very concerned early on in the statements and saying they didn't have a blackout, they just had a 22 pistol. And he also said... Eventually, he's like, well, I think I replaced it. Uh, well, I guess I replaced it. I'm certain I replaced it if you listen to his various statements. Very vague and fuzzy about this third blackout. And told the friends, Paul's friends, who, one of whom, both of whom testified, but Will Loving in particular. And what did Will Loving say? The defendant said the gun went missing around Christmas time of 2020. But Will Loving said, no, I was with Paul. I was with Paul in turkey season, which is in the spring. I was with Paul in turkey season, and we sat out at the steps right outside the house that y'all went to today, right on that side entrance that goes into the gun room. And if you look down, you can see how they were digging a pond and how you could fire down in that area. And they set up some targets to sight it in. And we were shooting that other gun. We were shooting that other gun, that replacement gun. And it had a red dot sight on it. Not a thermal scope, but a red dot. A red dot, which is not good at shooting at night. But they were shooting it and sighting it in with the red dot, the tan gun. He was with Paul while they were shooting that gun right there. And what did Jeff Croft, who testified before you, find right there? Weathered cases or casings. Weathered cases, right where Will said he and Paul were shooting that gun just a couple months prior to the murders. S&B, 147 grain, blackout rounds. And those rounds and empty boxes and the pictures are in evidence and the rounds are in evidence were found all over that property. S&B, 147 grain blackout. There were full clips found, there were empty boxes found, and there were also cases found, S&B, 147 grain blackout rounds found across the street at their shooting house. Two separate locations on the property but what's really important, again, goes back to what Will said. I was with Paul when we shot that replacement gun right there. Right there. And you heard forensic scientist Paul Greer testify that the six cases, items two through seven, the six cases found around Maggie that killed her, were 
loaded into, extracted, and ejected through the same firearm that fired those weather cases right outside the door where y'all went to today and at the shooting range across the street. A family blackout killed Maggie. It was present just a couple months prior to the murders, and it's gone now. It's gone now. A family weapon the defendant cannot account for killed Maggie. But what about the shotgun? The 12-gauge shotgun that was loaded with one federal double-alt buck and one dry-lock number two steel shot. Well, first of all, you heard that the two weapons that Paul often favored and often carried were this shotgun right here and the blackout. Those were his two guns, his favorite guns, aside from his deer rifle. The defendant had that gun with him when Daniel Green, the first deputy on the scene, showed up. And shotguns, as you heard, are a little bit different than rifles. And the conclusion there was, was that the two fired shells that were inside the feed room that killed Paul had class characteristics similar with that Benelli, Super Black Eagle 3, but insufficient individual identifying marks to either match or exclude it. That shotgun right there. But what did you else did you hear about the shotguns? Paul had the Spinelli Super Black Eagle III. That was his gun. Camo print, camo strap. Nolan Tootin, Nathan Tootin, Will Loving, Rogan, all identified that as Paul's gun. It's the one that Alec had. It's got Maggie's DNA and blood on the receiver. You heard from the DNA expert. And it was loaded with 12 gauge and a 16 gauge misloaded round. What else did you hear? You also heard about the Super Black Eagle 2. <coughs> and you heard from Nolan and Nathan that this was Buster's gun. This is the Super Black Eagle 2 that had the Mojo sticker on it. And that was recovered during SLED's search of the residents the next day. Well, what else did you hear? You heard from Nathan and Nolan that the defendant's favorite gun was a Super Black Eagle 1. Remember Nathan going through each one of these guns and how knowledgeable he was as to the differences between them? Sled search Moselle for every 12 gauge. No Super Black Eagle 1. Family weapons. Family weapons killed these victims. And on top of that, just like the SMB 147, well, not as much, but they're in evidence. Federal double alt buck and the Winchester dry lock steel two shot. Rounds were recovered at various locations on the property. What does that mean? We started, we talked about motive, means. The defendant had the means to commit these crimes.
the beginning of the case, I talked to you about some of the evidence that you would hear. And I held up my cell phone. And there's been a lot of that evidence, but the last witness you heard in the state's case in chief was Peter Rudolfsky. And he went through that timeline. And what does it show? We're going motive means opportunity. Opportunity to commit the crime. And what does this timeline show? These are all the information, the various sources of information that were in this timeline. And let's look at what it shows. First thing right here is that the defendant arrived at Moselle at 6 42. Now, I'll say one thing. You've heard a lot of testimony about what he said about times, what time he got home, what time he went to the office, how long he was at Almeida. Certainly, people can have some variability in assessing that. But he almost never was right. Almost never was right. 642. He arrives at Moselle. Paul, according to his extraction, gets there about 7.04. And about 7.03, we see the defendant steps registering on his phone. And then, over the next 30 minutes or so, we see a symmetry general symmetry between the steps between Paul's phone and Alex's phone as he described walking the property. At 7.39 we have creation of the Snapchat video that had the clothes on it. When that ultimately was recovered and you saw the interview it was shown to the defendant, who had provided his clothes that night. And at the first time then, he started talking about changing his clothes, and we'll talk more about that later. Again, 7.55 to 8.05, we have some symmetry with the steps. We have Paul Murdaugh's battery life, and you heard from the experts that have reviewed Paul's usage but like many kids his age, he's constantly flirting with it being low. But that doesn't stop him from using it, and you see that in the evidence in this case as well. 756, again, that's when Paul sends the Snapchat to his friends. And then at 808, we see Paul leave the kennel area at 806 and 808 make his way down to the residence. Eight oh five to eight oh nine. Around that time that Paul is getting there at eight oh eight, that's the last step activity on Alex's phone. And it's the last step activity until nine oh two, which we'll talk about in a minute. Alex's phone pretty much goes with no activity for that time period. And also he has no cell activity from 6.52 to 9.04, which is right in that time period we'll talk about in a little bit. So, eating dinner. You heard the defendant talk about eating dinner. Paul is at that residence, if you look right here, from 8.14 down to 835. And again, that timeline exhibit, there's a big one and then there's a condensed one. And all of this is in there uh, in evidence for y'all to look at. He's at that residence from 814 to 835. Now, the defendant, again, despite having a photographic memory, a new photographic memory about things that he told y'all that people are hearing for the first time, still can't remember specific things about Maggie's activities, as to when Maggie arrived, as to what they talked about. 
He can remember dropping his phone down in the console, but he can't remember things like that. He wants to remember things that help him try to explain to you why he never told the truth about maybe the most important thing he could tell law enforcement. But he can remember very specific details. He still gets this wrong. But she arrives at 817 in Moselle. They're already there. How do we know that? Because her cell phone disconnects from her Mercedes at 817, and that's when she starts showing steps. Then Paul, what's he doing? He's still using his phone like always. We see the battery life, but he's still sending snaps. He's receiving snaps. Bless you. He's sending to his friends, all these friends right here. He's receiving these snaps all during that time from 817 to 830, continuing to communicate with his friends, using his phone like always. And then what happens? About 830, Maggie's phone registers some steps. And consistent with that, consistent with her and Paul going down to the kennels, riding down to the kennels, we see Paul's Murdoch phone start showing steps. And then down here at 8.38, he's at in that kennel area where those dots are. And if you look at that particular slide from 8.38 to 8.44, that's going to be the last GPS reading on Paul's phone, 844. You heard from Rogan. And you've heard from Rogan as it references this timeline. And Rogan tells you and told you from that witness stand that he was having a conversation with Paul about cash and the, and the dog's tail. They were having an active conversation about that. Paul calls Rogan at 8.40 and they're talking about it. And Rogan says, send me a FaceTime, but if it doesn't work, send me a video. At 8.44, 4 minutes and 14 seconds, we have right here the FaceTime, but it only lasts 11 seconds. And then at 8.44.55, that's when the kennel video was recorded, the last 50 seconds. At the beginning of this investigation, as you'll recall the testimony, they didn't have Paul's password and couldn't get in. And you heard in the defendant's August 11th statement that when he was asked about Rogan saying he may have heard Alec on the phone during this time, he said, well, I'd be surprised if that were the case. Because law enforcement didn't have this kennel video. They didn't have this kennel video until April of 2022, when Paul's phone was finally unlocked. And that changed everything. Why did it change everything? Opportunity. Being at the scene of the crime when the murders occurred. Opportunity. And more importantly, exposing the defendant's lies about the most important thing he could have told law enforcement. When was the last time I saw my wife and child alive? Why in the world would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that and lie about it so early if he didn't know that was there? And he could always say, well, Rogan must be mistaken. I'm surprised. Not if my times are right, was what he said. Rogan told you I was expecting that video right there. That was supposed to be the next thing that happened. Send me the video because we were worried about Cash the dog's tail. He talked about how 
his girlfriend was going to call a veterinarian or she had some association with one. It was an active conversation going on right then and right there. And what's going on still? Paul's still also texting his friends. You might recall that in opening statement, the defense counsel said, oh, he was texting after that video for 10 minutes. It's not for 10 minutes. It's for barely a minute. Down here, 848.58 to 849.01. That's the last time that Paul's phone was unlocked. What do we know? We know that the defendant was there just minutes earlier at the scene of the crime with the victims. Eight forty nine oh one Paul's phone locks. He never sends that video to Rogan. You heard Rogan say that when he watched that video. You heard him say, that's the video I was supposed to receive. That is the video that my friend was supposed to send to me. And he never did. In fact, Rogan responds at 849.35, and he says, see if you can get a good picture of him. Mary Ann, his girlfriend, wants to send it to a girl we know that's a vet. Tell him to sit and stay, and he shouldn't move around too much. Even though this is an active conversation with Paul, who you heard from multiple friends, was one to respond and use his cell phone, Paul never reads it. Paul never reads it. What happens at 849-31? We're 849-01 for Paul. 849-31. Maggie reads... Lynn's response to the group thread about Mr. Randolph. And then her phone locks forever. It was never unlocked again until it's recovered the next day. Down here. 6 8 at 110. Eight forty nine for both of them. The defendant, after hearing multiple individuals of his family and friends and law partners get on the stand and listen to that video and say that's him on that video, got on the stand. For the first time, and said, Okay, I was there. He was forced into doing what he does all the time, and that's coming up with a new lie when he's confronted with evidence he can no longer deny. And the only reason he did that, the only reason he did that, is because all those witnesses at that witness stand said, Yeah, that's him. He's there. Why would he lie about that, ladies and gentlemen? Why would he even think to lie about that if he were an innocent man? Why would he even think about that? But he got on the stand and he told you a story, and we're going to talk more about that story in a minute. But his story was was that he didn't want to go down there, and then he went down there, and, and he went down there really quick, and got care of the chicken and went straight back and he can't remember anything about what he talked about with Maggie. He can't remember their conversation at dinner, but he's, he's dadgum sure about the fact that he went down there and went straight back. But even if you give him the benefit of the doubt, his story doesn't make sense because that kennel video is 50 seconds. It's over at 845.45. Even if you give him the benefit of the doubt that he could take care of the chicken and maybe the fastest dog and chicken chase ever, 
and put that chicken up and not say a word to Maggie and Paul and get on that golf cart and drive all the way back to the house, where does that put you? It puts you right at 849. At which point he claims he went inside and he managed to doze for a second. But then he's up at 902, perhaps the quickest nap ever. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a new story to fit facts he can no longer deny. From a person who not a single person who was close to him knew who he really was. Not a single person close to him hadn't been lied to by this man. And I would submit to you that this one is the most blatant one yet. And we'll talk more about that in a second. What happened at 849? Y'all been to the scene. That feed room door is probably a bit tighter than this. But you saw the evidence from Kenny Kinsey and all the rest of them that clearly Paul was in. The middle of that feed room. It's a kill zone. Nobody in there with him. He's in that room. No defensive wounds at all. His hands are down. And he takes that shot, buckshot to the chest. And any person who did that would probably think that took care of business because this buckshot, but for some reason he was canned this way and it went through. It was a million and one shot. But it didn't kill him. Alec thought it did. Alec, the lawyer, Alec, the prosecutor, Alec is thinking through that we'll see he's manufacturing an alibi and he's also manufacturing the fact that there's two guns used. But we know, unlike the expert they call from Connecticut where they can't even get ARs, who doesn't know about people riding around on property, he doesn't know about Paul and the two guns he likes to use, he doesn't know about this family and how common those guns are together. He says, well, his only conclusion is well, it would be practical for somebody just to to, to fire out the clip. But this is him. This is Alec, the prosecutor, the lawyer. And he's thinking through this. He's thought through this. He's going to use two guns because it's going to confuse people that perhaps there are two shooters. But again, it doesn't make sense. Two family weapons? But he thinks Paul's shot. And you heard the testimony that Paul appears in the feed room doorway. Is Alex putting down that shotgun to pick up the blackout and is startled by Paul? And that's why the angle's like that and catches Paul like that and, and goes up into the ceiling, as you've heard the testimony from Kinsey, and blows, blows his brains out. And what happens with Maggie right here? We see activity on Maggie's phone. You heard about Sandal Prince. You heard from Kenny Kinsey about the mark on her leg from the Polaris over there by the overhang next to the feed room. You've seen the diagrams and the crime scene photos that all those cases are in that area between the doorway to the feed room and where Maggie was found. You heard that Maggie had no defensive wounds. You also heard Paul and sibling from that first shot, a close range shot, with no indication that he detected a threat from the person who fired that weapon. And why? Because it was him. Same with Maggie. Because Maggie sees what happens and she comes running over there, running to her baby. Probably the last thing on her mind, thinking that it was him who had done this, she's running to her baby. Well, he's gotten picked up the blackout and opens fire at close range, again with no defensive wounds. And she takes those two shots that you heard Dr. Reamer say were parallel, and it crumples her over. In those cases, you can see them move around. It takes that shot that goes through here, and she goes down flat, and then there's the shot in the back of the head.
Malice? Is that malice, ladies and gentlemen? Is that malice to do that? Is that intentional harm to another with a bad intent, with an evil intent to do those things? Clearly, I submit to you. Clearly, it's malicious. Clearly, it's malicious. She was running to her baby, heard that shot and was running to her baby when she got mowed down by the only person that we have conclusive proof was at that scene just minutes before and who lied about that very fact until he could no longer do it to you last week. Alec told you he went down there in the golf cart. We'll talk about this a little bit, but they had their expert come up here with the, the two, five, two people and, and all the rest of it. Be sitting in a golf cart. But he comes up in the golf cart. But what we don't see, as I said before, is any activity from on his phone until 9.02. If the crime occurred around 8.49 to 8.53, down there at the feed room, State's Exhibit 516. It's just a diagram. Remember that Roger Dale Davis did about the kennels and the hose there and how it wasn't put up the way he would put it up? If you're going to wash off real quick, what better place to do it? The water, the pictures of the water in State's 199 and 190. It wouldn't take long to strip down and wash yourself off. Get in that cart and head back to the house. <coughs> and then at 9.02, the defendant over there, who wouldn't even admit until forced to that he was even at the scene, all of a sudden he is as busy as he has ever been. 9.02 to 9.06, 283 steps. 9.03, we see the system start up on the car, and that could mean that he's close by the car. Has he returned with Maggie's phone and placed it in that car? And then what do we see from 9.02 to 9.06? Not only is he 283 steps in that four-minute period, but he is making calls like crazy. And I asked him, I said, what were you doing? What were you doing? And, and even though he has a photographic memory about things that he thinks will convince you, he could not answer what he's doing during this four-minute period that is so illustrating of what we're talking about here. That for four minutes, he is not only going 283 steps, this is a defense exhibit, defense 156. Two eighty-three steps, and they put in the distance. We heard the distance isn't as accurate, but it's a, it illustrates the point. That's two hundred eight meters. Meter, you know, roughly is a yard, a little bit more, a little bit less. I don't remember, but let's say it's six hundred feet. It's a lot, and he couldn't remember what he was doing. I asked him, "You been on a treadmill? Were you doing jumping jacks? What were you doing at the same time you're calling all these phones?" Why is he calling multiple times? We can see right here. He's, he calls Maggie. He calls Randolph. He calls Maggie again. All of that four-minute period where he's moving around. But he couldn't remember what he was doing. Just getting ready. Is the prosecutor, the lawyer, manufacturing his alibi? 
because he knows he's got to get to Alameda quick. He's got to compress those timelines, and that's exactly why he knew to lie about being at the kennels to start with. He's got to compress those timelines so that it would convince whoever down the road that he couldn't have done it. He's got to compress them. And that's why he's doing all that right then and there. System startup, 905.56 in the Suburban. And then, this is interesting, Maggie's phone has that orientation change to portrait two seconds before Alex's second call goes in to her phone. If it's some random vigilante, some random vigilante who knew to hide out there and counted on family guns being there, did he have ESP? Did he have ESP to move that? Or was that Alec? turning the phone as he got to the Suburban, checking as he manufactured his alibi that it was coming through. And we saw how quickly out of the gate when law enforcement arrived and in his first interview, how he's immediately referring to his phone. And besides that, you've heard about Alec. You heard from witnesses. He went down to the kennels, but he didn't take his phone. Is that also the lawyer and the prosecutor making sure his phone was not with him when he went down there? You heard testimony it would be unusual for him not to take that phone down to the kennels. And then he gets underway. With this call right here too. All those calls, all those steps when his phone finally goes active just minutes after he was at the scene with the victims and he lied about it and he's so busy. But let's, let's take him at his word again. Why in the world, if he's calling her so much, if he's so busy and so concerned to call her as many times as that in a four-minute period, why... Why would he not just drive by the kennels? Why would he not just drive down there to say, hey, hey, Max, I'm going to Almeida. What you guys doing? Hey, Paul, you want to go? Why is he so busy and making so many calls but doesn't drive the less than a minute down there to see what they're up to? Why would he not do that? And you've heard testimony from Marion. You even heard it from the defendant's own mouth about whether or not Maggie was going to go with him to Almeida, that Alec had actually asked her to come home that night, which he denies, and said in his statement that he found out later that that was the case. But you saw the text from Blanca. And you heard from Marion that Alec wanted Maggie to come home that night to make sure of it. Malice? With all of that, why would he not just turn and drive down there? He was just there in the golf cart. Why would he not drive down there? Why is he so anxious to have missed calls for her and he was just there and not drive down there? About the same general time period that he lied to until he tried to tell you what he told you from the stand last week. Right here, he suburban connects to the uh, Alex's iPhone. He calls Maggie at 906.52, and he's getting in the Suburban right at that time. Maggie's back life goes off from 907 to 931, and you've heard the testimony from the various experts about the back life. And then he leaves Moselle Road at 907.06. All of this is fitting together. He's on the move. At 
He's right here doing 42 miles an hour, and there's Maggie's phone location. And at 908.42, he's just passing. And at 908.58, just 20 seconds after he's almost at that location, he texts Maggie's phone and says, going to check on him, be right back. That text was unread. Now, there's been a lot of discussion from all the experts about the backlight issue. And every single one of them said that there's a lot of variables about that light coming on. Every single one of them said it's not going to record an orientation change unless that light is on. And you heard from each one of the experts about those variables and about the fact that there's no guarantee that it's going to come on or not come on. And you heard from Paul McManigal about that issue. And they cross-examined him about that and all the rest of it, but it's just a common sense determination about how iPhones work about how they work. That raised awake feature is set for actual somebody lifting it up in the normal course. It is not set to respond necessarily to violent motion like flipping it. And every single expert testified to that. Every single one of them did. And then, besides that, you'd have to accept the fact that Alec is driving by just moments prior to that time. All of, this, all of these circumstances would have to go the other way of the reasonable inferences in this case. Paul McManigal got up there and testified as to these issues and as to the fact that there's no guarantee, in fact, more likely than not, that the, if the phone is violently thrown or flipped or frisbeed or whatever, it's not going to light up. And that's consistent with what every other expert said. Nine oh seven to nine twenty two. The defendant's on the way to Alameda, and you heard testimony from Mr. Rudolfsky about this, from Agent Rudolfsky. He's hitting 74 miles an hour at night on that particular route. What's he in a hurry about? That's faster than he drove to work. Why is he in a hurry? Because he knows he has to compress that timeline. And then along the way, he's manufacturing the alibi by making these short calls. 60 seconds. He calls Chris Wilson. He calls John Marvin. Chris Wilson calls him back. He's on the phone the entire way. Does he say to any of them, hey, I can't get Maggie on the phone? Say anything like that? They're very short. He doesn't talk about much. And then we get down here at 920. There's a 131 second call, which means that call is over at 922.45. And that's also when we see the vehicle go into park. That's when we have the arrival at Almeida as well. And you heard from defense witnesses that, well, people would park around back right there. Okay. It's also, though, near these structures. There's that line right there. But what do we see? From 922 to 932, we've got 195 steps taken. We have him calling Libby Murdoch, which would be calling the house two minutes later. And then from there, we have at 931 and 932, we have system startups on the Suburban, which you've heard from the experts could be from having that remote key in your pocket and walking near the car. 922 to 932 is the steps. And 931, you've got two system startups. And what did you hear? <coughs> 
from Shelley. That he called, but it still took a number of minutes before he came in. Well, that's about six minutes right there. Meanwhile, what's he so busy right there? And I'll meet him. Meanwhile, Rogan is trying to call his friend to no avail. He tries to message Maggie. Tell Paul to call me. Neither one of them can respond. Still a busy guy at Alameda. 9.35 to 9.45, we've got 60 steps. we also got another, at 9.36, around the beginning of that time period, another hit on the system startup. 9.36 to 9.41, down here. About a five-minute period, and we've got another hit. And then at 9.43.05, the Suburban moves out of park. He's not there very long. And he's moving around a lot and he's sitting off that car while he's at Alameda. He told law enforcement multiple stories about his trip there. You heard Miss Shelley Smith talk about that. You heard her talk about him trying to tell her how long he had been there. He says he was just trying to take, tell her the truth. But that's not how she felt. And Blanca didn't feel the same way when he tried to talk to her about what he was wearing that night. Both of these being people that's worked for that family for a long time. But he's a busy guy during all of this. Leaving Alameda, we have the pause. 9.44 and no seconds to 9.44 and 54 seconds. And that's during the time period that Alec calls that phone of Maggie's again. This is the time period where he remembered, because I asked him on cross, and he remembered very specifically about his phone falling down on the console and that whole story. Is that true, ladies and gentlemen? Or is he coming up with some details on the fly when he can't remember more important things, like what was the last conversation you had with your wife and child when you jetted down to the kennels and back? What did y'all talk about at dinner? What were you doing from 902 to 906? Those are questions he doesn't want to answer. But would a reasonable person remember those things? Would they not replay in their mind every day the last conversations that they had? Why would he remember that console story? Because he lies convincingly and easily, and he can do it at the drop of the hat. And you've heard testimony about that. He's been doing it to all the people who trust him for years. And he did it to y'all. He's manufacturing an alibi. He's smart. He's a good lawyer. His family has a history of prosecution. He understands these issues. That's why this case is a case that had to be figured out this particular way because he knows what to do to try to prevent evidence from being gathered. And if you listen to his statements again and listen to the questions he asks, he's asking questions like that. He's trying to figure out what do the police have? What do they know? He's a prosecutor trying to manufacture his alibi, and we see this again. He calls Paul. He sends a text, call me, babe. Of course, none of that's read or responded to. And then in 952.15, he calls Chris Wilson. Call me if you up. Call me if you up. And Chris calls back, and they chat for about two minutes, including the connection time. Two minutes. And what does Chris Wilson say? Well, he says it was a normal conversation. Well, of course it is with this guy. He's convincing. But what does Chris say? The only thing that they talked about was Chris bringing up some case. 
And then Alec was like, hey, I got to go. And then I'll meet her. Did Alex say, hey, I'm trying to get home. I can't get Maggie on the phone. I've called her like six times. Paul won't answer either. Did Alex say, he said, call me if you up. Did he say, did Chris say that Alex said, i got to ask you a question or let's talk about this? No, Chris brought up some case and it was mundane. It was Monday. This manufacturing alibi, he's calling anybody who will answer the phone for these short conversations and it's the first, one of the first things out of his mouth in the first interview. Look at my phone. I called this person, I called this person, I called this person, I called this person. He's manufacturing this alibi. Also, throughout all of this, all of this relevant time period, you see from the Dillon Hightower extraction, you'll see that over and over again, all these call logs that are deleted from the extraction. They're deleted, which occurred on June 10th. What's up with that? On the way back, and these are defense exhibits 141 and 142. Rolling pretty heavy at 75 to get there. And I'm sure the defense will point out that that 80 miles an hour was a peak. Still running pretty good there. What's he in a hurry about in the dark? Doing 80 miles an hour. At 9.51.42, rolling 80 when he texts Chris, call me if you're up. His peak speed when he's texting me. 10.01. He arrives at Alameda, and this is going to be important. Rogan, of course, is trying to call Paul, and he texts Paul, yo, which is unread, but hits Paul's phone. And then he gets to, says Alameda. Sorry about that. That's obviously back at Moselle. He gets there. He's shifting in and out of park from 2200, which is uh, 10 o'clock. To 10.01.43, he's calling Maggie at 10.03.58, and then at 10.05.06, he leaves for the kennels. At 10.05.57, he arrives at the kennels about a minute later. Make it a minute in a suburban. How long is it going to take in a golf cart? Ten o five fifty seven, he arrives at the kennels, and ten o six fourteen is the nine one one call. Now there's a lot of back and forth with him about that, but in his statements, with what he told his law partners, that he went in great detail over about his activities that night, including lying to them about ever going to the kennels. He was very clear that he got out of the car and went and checked Paul and Maggie. One time he said to see if they're breathing, another time to say to check a pulse. You've seen the horrific injuries they'd suffered. 19 seconds. Is that enough time for a surprised human being to come across that scene, process what they are seeing? Get out of the car. Go over there. Check both those bodies and then call 911. He's changed the story now yet again because he's conf confronted with this evidence. The reason why it's so quick, the reason why it's so quick is because he knew exactly what scene he was going to find. 19 seconds. During that 911 call, and you can hear it on the 911 call, he leaves for the residence from 1011 to 1014, and you can see the, uh, the map points on there. And those are the speeds on the Suburban on those trips. 
took just under a minute doing 35 and 30 miles an hour. So think about that when you go back to his story about a casual trip down to the kennels in the golf cart and you look at his times that he's trying to convince you of. Ten seventeen, he gets off the 911 call. He calls Randy. He calls Randy again. He calls John Marvin. And then we see at 10, 20, and 8 seconds, Paul's phone re reflect that auto lock thing that could be, as you heard from the testimony, it not recognizing a face. And this is interesting. As we'll see over the next few slides, he spends a whole lot of time trying to call Rogan Gibson. He told you, oh, well, he's, he's a good boy. He lives down the street. He lives close by. He's calling Rogan before he calls many of his family, before he calls Buster. Calling Rogan multiple times. And those texts would have come in on Paul's phone. What's he so concerned about? He said he turned Paul over and his cell phone popped out. This is a sealed exhibit. I'm not going to aim it. Popped out. Manufacturing an alibi, concerned about the evidence. Worried about what Rogan may have known or may have heard. I'll put it down. Can I have this back, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Sure. There, 1024, iMessages, call me, 1025, 1029, 1025, the first deputy's on the scene, 1029, calling Randy, 1030, Rogan again, and then finally at 1034 is when Paul's phone powers off. Opportunity. Motive, means, and opportunity. <clears throat> Guilty conscience. I've already kind of talked about these, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but you heard from Blanca Simpson. Blanca Simpson said he was wearing like a polo shirt when he left. He was wearing this shirt in the Vinnie Vine. She recognized both of those. He, of course, turned over the T-shirt that he was wearing when, when law enforcement arrived. And then you heard Blanca say he later tried to convince her that he was wearing a Vinnie Vine shirt. Three shirts in one day. And a fourth one he tried to get Blanca to say. And you, and you heard her testimony. She felt very uncomfortable by that. Multiple changes of shoes in the day. He wouldn't be wearing those shoes if he were out riding the property. I've already mentioned the text from Maggie that Alan wants me to come home. But he can't even be clear about that point because that doesn't fit with his narrative. Marion Proctor says the same thing, but he can't admit that because that doesn't fit with his narrative. She was surprised that Maggie didn't go along to Almeida. And then she said, Alec made an interesting comment, one of many, some of which came from that stand that we'll talk about in a little bit. Whoever did this thought about it for a really long time. Why would he say that? Because he told you that it was just 
random vigilantes from the boat case, of which there is no evidence whatsoever that you've seen in this record. Trials depend on evidence. There has to be evidence to make a decision. And his claims trying to manufacture something about the Babe case, there's been no evidence whatsoever of any specific other individual. There has to be evidence to consider, not just mere allegations that have no basis in any sort of evidence. Whoever did this thought about it for a really long time. I think if you think about the defendant's statements and some of the things he says, a lot of times he says things in one context, but he means them in another. When he says things like, I hurt the ones I love the most. We talked about Shelley. After Randolph's funeral, he shows up early. She might have said Wednesday, but there was other information that Randolph's funeral was on Monday. But anyway, shows up with something blue, shows up early, wants to come in, goes and moves some vehicles. And then there's that raincoat, huge raincoat. She calls it a tarp, but it's a huge raincoat. And it's got a ton of GSR on the inside. And it's found in a closet upstairs. States for 11. He was a busy guy in Alameda, as we just saw. He was moving around, kept hitting off of his Suburban. And then, of course, as you heard, he was with family for the next few days. After the funeral, he's back. And it was weird enough and interesting enough that Shelley said something about it. I'm also saying that in her experience, it was unusual for him to come that way. Then we have the defendant and his many statements. Went through a lot with the defendant who told you that the reason why he was telling this, you, you this new story was because he was paranoid because he had a bag of pills in his pocket, because he had a distrust of SLED because David Owen asked him about his relationship with Maggie. And his law partners told him that he should have an attorney present, which one is in here, one of his law partners sitting in the back. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. I asked him repeatedly, is this the point where you decided to lie? At which point did you decide to lie? I hate to have to do this. I understand. I'm gonna do that twice. I or was it this point when he first says I was at the house? I was at the house. Or was this the point? He said, he mentioned specifically, and he kept adding factors, and one of the things was, well, Dave Owen asked me how my relationship was. This question, this is when he decided to lie? How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, wonderful mm -hmm. relationship. But he digs in on the point. What did you do today? 
Were you in the office or? No, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up. I called Maggie. Didn't get an answer. And I left to go to my mom's. She had said. This is June 8th at 121 in the morning. And he's admitted to you that he's lying right there. Look how easily he did it. About such a crucial thing. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. Mm -hmm. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. It was odd, but not that big a deal. But again, he's enough to say it was odd. He's enough to make all those calls while he's doing 283 steps, but he doesn't drive 50 seconds down to the kennels. Going to the next interview. Again, what's the tone of this interview? How is he being treated? Pretty traumatic. That's okay. Um, yeah. I know so, you yeah. need to ask me. You ask me what you need to. So, is that an aggressive interview? Is that something that makes somebody paranoid? I'm a defendant in a civil case involving my son. I told you about mm -hmm. the boat wreck. Yes, sir. And there were some motions coming up in that on Thursday, and I was mostly just getting ready for those things, okay. and then other junk. Mentions the boat case. Paul and Paul left. And I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming Paul left okay. because of, you know, gotcha. what happened. I mean, I'm assuming Paul yeah, yeah. went to the kennels. Okay. Um, and what did you do once once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And I was watching TV, looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. Okay. And what time did you? You know, I don't know exactly what time I woke up, but when y'all get my phone, you know, I think one of the first things I did when I got up was call Maggie mm -hmm. because I was going to my mom's. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I texted her because I checked my phone. And what time did we say the text was, Jim? It's like 9.06. I, I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I, I got it written down for you. I night. showed you the other yes, night, yes, didn't I? Yes, sir. I got so, it. you know, I texted her. So I called her just before that. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, she she didn't answer at that point, um, and I left to go to my mom's. So easy for him to do. And you say you said you laid down and, and took a little nap, and when you got up, Maggie and Paul was gone, or did they leave when you laid down? Or before uh, I, I believe that. I'm not. I'm not sure. But they weren't there when you woke up around the nine o'clock mark or so when when you made the call to Maggie to, to let her know you were going to. No, house. nobody was in that house when I when I left. Adding more detail. This just lies. Watch how he responds to this one. Watch what his head does. See if you observe that yourself when he's over there looking you in your eyes and trying to convince you of something. Trying to narrow that the, the last time that Paul and you saw Paul and Maggie's when y'all were eating supper. Yes, sir. When the when when Paul's phone came out, did you you just pick it up and put it on, you know, place it back down on him, or? You know, 
Yeah, I did not try to open it or anything. You know, I just, I don't know how I had in my mind that I needed to not mess anything up. I had that, I had that, you know, Third interview on August 11th. And after dinner, Maggie uh, went to the kennels, or you know, I don't know exactly how that went. Um, I stayed on the couch and I dozed off. Very specific recollections for y'all when he testified with his new story that had never been heard until last week. Did he and I? No, but Rogan Gibson told me about uh, the dog's tail and somebody saying his leg was broken. Well, right there, he was down at the kennels. Shaking his head forward.
come back to that. But I want to talk a little bit about the crime scene. What it indicates. I want to advise everyone there will be likely to be sealed exhibits. I don't need the know quite yet. Thank you, Mr. Public Chairman. Sure. You guys went out to the scene today and you saw how it looks now. We'll take a good look at those trees and where they were back in the day of the incident. And I'll put this up on the Elmo in a second. And you can see the proximity of the kennels to that residence back on June 7th, 2021. Get out of the elmo, please. What's up, Have the uh, PowerPoint back, please. Still, uh, there's not any images in the PowerPoint that I'm interested in, but I do have these right here. <coughs> All right, Dr. Reamer. You've heard from Dr. Reamer, you heard from Kenny Kinsey, and you heard from the defense experts. So, Have the uh, computer back. Paul, first blast to the chest, stippling, arms down, not fatal for a buckshot blast to the chest. This is where there was some dispute. From the defense experts, the second injury went into the left shoulder, into the cheek, with an exit wound on the top of the head, with instantly fatal and terminal collapse. Dr. Reamer's done 5,500 5, autopsies. She does an independent autopsy. She actually physically examined the victim, and she was very clear that it could not have happened from the top without destroying Paul's face. And I can show the image again. I'm reluctant to because I know y'all have seen it enough. So I'll rely on y'all to recall that his face was intact. I'll rely on y'all to recall, and this is sealed, all the evidence up top here at the top of the door. I will rely on y'all to recall Kenny Kinsey's testimony that buckshot don't reverse course, that the kinetic energy is going in one direction. I rely on y'all to recall all the biological matter that you see at the top of this door. States 339, which is the wadding from the shot to kill Paul. Because if you recall, the wadding from the chest shot was found still in his chest right here. This is the wadding on the ground from the shot 
his head. And if one of the things that you recall from Dr. Reimer's testimony in looking at Paul's face was the abrasions around that cheek wound that came from the wadding as it entered there. You heard from Dr. Reimer that the reason for the shape on the shoulder was because it went along the shoulder and opened up that area there, but still was focused and then expanding as it entered in here. But she also testified that if it was here, that force would not have left his face intact. manner of death homicide. And then you heard from Dr. Kenny Kinsey. What we described earlier, Paul was first shot in the feed room, largely agrees with her, arms were not up. He believes the shot was a little closer and the lack of stippling could be talk, chalked up to the black t-shirt, but also agrees as she does, no defensive wounds. Looking at the blood spatter locations there, and he testified in great detail and testified yesterday, there was no high-velocity blood spatter on the ground at the entrance to the feed room, which would be necessary for the shot to have occurred in the manner in which the defense suggested. The spatter travels upward in an upward direction, uh, upward direction and you can see that on the door. He spoke of the, blood, the void area, and then he spoke of the blood on the ground that was around where Paul drops and that it's low speed spatter. He talked about the dents in the feed room door, the pellet lodged in the door frame upper. It's only possible if it's traveling through Paul's head. Not possible if it's from a ricochet, as the defense suggested. And steel is much less malleable than lead. What else did he say? Dr. Kinsey said that he, I think three dozen times that he's observed contact wounds to the head with a shotgun, including one that happened in front of him, actually observed it. And he also said that any sort of contact wound like that would have destroyed the head and destroyed the face. And he was clear about that. He's actually seen them. And I think what you see with the defense experts is they're coming to you with absolutes to try to make you consider that there's the possibility that a crime scene can definitively establish whether there's one or two shooters or whether or not they're of a certain height. And that's just not how it works. And you heard that from Dr. Kinsey. That's not how it works. Not how it worked in this scene. It's a red herring, ladies and gentlemen. It's a red herring. You've seen the testimony from Kenny Kinsey. They returned to talk about these issues. You saw the demonstration over there in the doorway. Does that seem realistic to you? Or is Kenny Kinsey's explanation consistent with the evidence, consistent with his experience, consistent with Dr. Reamer's 5,500 autopsies who actually observed the victims, consistent with the blood spatter, the lack of high velocity on the floor, but the existence of high velocity on the top and the low velocity blood splatter on the floor. What's consistent with the evidence? Maggie. Again, no defensive wounds. The first two shots to her abdomen and her leg on a parallel path and likely in close succession. Stippling.
close range, the mark on the back of her leg, running to her baby, didn't see it coming, bends over, maybe on her hands and knees in pain. You saw me demonstrate that with both Dr. Reamer and Kenny Kinsey. And that's when she suffers that third rifle injury. And you heard their expert come in and say, no, it had to be going this way instead of this way. Going up with that graze, hitting her breast, and into her head here. And Dr. Reamer actually performed the autopsy physically. She looked at the hole. She described the hole. She talked about the injury coming up into the head. And she showed you that. And she took issue with this idea that you can look at skin tags and that sort of thing and come to any conclusion about directionality. But what she told you is, I looked at this wound. I saw the hole as it went up into the brain. This was an entrance wound up into the head. Instantly fatal, internal collapse. The wrist wound could have been an extraneous wound or it could be associated with this. Third rifle injury and then of course the fourth rifle injury to the back of the head. They had the canyon in effect. Would have been instantly fatal except for the fact that this one, there has to be some clearance for that third shot to come up. Again, manner of death is homicide. So what did Dr. Kinsey say? Again, he took issue with an expert coming in and trying to tell you that he can determine the location or the height of the shooter in this manner. He told you the cardboard that cannot be relied upon. And while he did agree with the angle on the doghouse, he showed you how changing the aspect of the shooter could easily fit with Alec. And that it is too far and way out over its skis to try to assert that you can determine from such information that the shooter had to be 5'2". That's not what you can do. Dr. Kinsey is a crime scene analyst. How many crime scenes did he say he'd done? Hundreds of homicides, thousands of pieces of evidence, real world stuff. That's what he comes and talks about. And you simply can't make those determinations in a real world environment to come in here and try to tell you that from that sort of thing the shooter had to be a particular height. You just can't do it. You can't do it. I submit to you that Dr. Kinsey knows what he's talking about, and Dr. Kinsey has the years of experience in real-world applications of crime scenes to make those judgments. And I also submit to you that Dr. Kinsey isn't going to get out over his skis and try to make assertions to you in absolutes. The guy with the two five-two people refused to even concede the possibility of variables. But Dr. Kinsey knows that that's how reality works, and he's not going to get out of her over his skis and try to tell you something that simply cannot be supported by the evidence. And that's what the defense expert did. The shooter could easily be 6'4 or, or taller and fit all those bullet trajectories. Of course, one thing that the defense expert didn't consider and wouldn't even consider as all his little gray people are holding the guns down like this. No consideration of kneeling, of sitting, of being in any sort of different position. But the reality is these are fluid. Maggie is running to her baby. She's moving, and when she gets hit, most likely when she hits her leg against that Polaris, there was biological uh, evidence on that Polaris, and she comes forward and collapses as Alec is moving around her, firing. that x 
expert come in yesterday, and I've kind of mentioned this, but I'll mention it again, who came in was it yesterday, the day before. Even I've lost track of time at this point. But try to get out over his skis again and testify to you that it had to be two shooters because there were two guns. And why would you not just use the blackout? Is that opinion helpful or makes sense? Knowing what you know about this case and knowing what you know about the firearms of this particular house and knowing what you know about Alec Murdoch as you look at the rest of this evidence and what he's trying to manufacture to confuse these issues. Kenny Kenzie told you that it's just as likely that it could be one shooter and Although this is not to scale, you have the feed room right here, the Polaris is right here, and the cases, while they can't be relied upon as specific location, they still are, can be illustri illustrating general area, and they're all in that area, moving from here to here. GSR on the defendant's hand and the seat belt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15-minute break. We'll go to the